All right, everyone, welcome. Um, really excited. Uh, Dr. G, normally myself and I, usually you get two for the price of one. Today, I will give you myself an alter ego, so it'll still be two. Uh, to kind of present this um, this wonderful uh, presentation, uh, an opportunity to be able to talk a little bit about peers and clinicians. Um, and this came out of my the movement that I'm part of, which is the whole peer uh, SB803 movement from back in 2019, 2020 with, you know, Sally Zimmerman, you know, Campro and all that good stuff that was going on and really elevating the peer voice and lived experience. So from that, uh, we, I, you know, got involved and was supported by, by MindOC, Be Well, and other organizations that really like what we were doing to really empower peers. And that's wonderful. I really loved it. Uh, as we were developing this, uh, I built a relationship realizing that peers are not the only ones in the world, although sometimes we feel we are. And although we're doing a great job and we may be the debutantes of this ball for a while in the peer movement, we also cannot forget the aspect of the clinician and the you know therapist, social worker, all of those other areas that actually are in the medical model, maybe not necessarily in the same model that peers use, but ha are actually doing a lot in the industry for, for us to be able to actually um, bring both together Dr. G, which is, you know, Dr. Ezon, uh, he usually represents this part, but I'm going to represent both aspect of the clinician. The clinician has, uh, has an incredible, um, you know, part in this whole development of the recovery model and especially in behavioral health services. But we are very two distinct camps, and that's you know that's where we can kind of split our personalities. I'm on the on the peer side, you know. Peers are all about lived experience. You know, we're there. We talk to everyone about what is going on, what is happening. Um, we you know involve everyone. We make them our friends. We help them through the process. On the other hand, then you have the clinicians. The clinicians are trained in such a way that they actually are not able to do a lot of the things based on their training. And peers don't understand clinicians. Clinicians don't understand uh, peers. And we find out that I don't even know if they like the other side. Peers on our side have always been kind of put down by a lot of the clinicians, not for any other reason, but other for the fact that we understand now that they are licensed in such a way that they have to follow really strict guidelines in order to make sure that that client is getting the support that they need. So bottom line, what we, what we have done is we've created, and you know, again, I'm just putting a few of the core competencies and the comparisons between the clinicians and the peers. And I, and I, this curriculum that we've created, and it's still developing as we get more feedback. When we have, when we do presentations like this and get the feedback, we start adding, improving, and always developing it even better so that peers can understand the work of clinicians, clinicians, and what we do is a lot of training so they can work together and meet at a point where that client is getting the best service possible. So that's kind of in a nutshell. But again, we go through the core competencies of psychotherapists, core competencies of, of peer, peer support specialists, which I have to add, I have to make modifications already. I'm at the state level, and I have to say that we as peer, peers have to include community health workers. Community health workers are actually those that are pretty much a lived experience, of course, maybe uh, doing a little bit more focus on the uh, health disparities and those issues of health education. But they, many of our peers that are certified also identify themselves as community health workers. So I just wanted to add that because that's something that we see really changing in the field of peer certification. And at, at the state level, DHCS is developing that right now. So that is something that we, um, that we pretty much want to make sure we put that out there. History of peer support, you know, peer support has been around even probably longer than the 60s. I would say peer support, you can actually say back uh, as far as the AA and, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and, and some of the 12-step, I think I could probably consider some of those peer support. 
So this movement and this the 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 value that peers bring uh, for those that may not have or are not in your if you're in the clinical aspect and have not utilized a peer hasn't been around for a long time. There's a lot of data. And again, in California specifically, of course, SB803 and all of that created even more of a peer certification. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of the history. History of clinicians, of course, is definitely way back. And, you know, uh, as far as, you know, to diagnose and all of the things, that, there's a lot of, you know, scientific evidence-based practices to diagnose and diagnose and treat patients. And again, that's a high, big responsibility. Uh, as we know, uh, the, the, as far as the clinicians, they, they go back as far enough to, to do some of the ugly exper experimentations that they did with humans in order to find out how they function. So they've been around for a while in many different capacities. Um, and again, doctors such as medical doctors, uh, nurses, therapists, all of those in the clinical areas that specialize in, in certain areas are also, um, you know, at that level. Um, the roles and purposes of peers, as we know, is to navigate. Uh, there is right now the peer certification, the 17 core competencies that are going through, um, you know, DHCS, CalMesa is, of course, doing one of the leading as far as trainings and many other organizations like CalVoices. I think uh, Campro is still doing some painted brain, for example. In Los Angeles is is the leader, and I know I, I share as well is also part of all that where they're developing the peer and putting them through the process of certification. So that is going on uh, besides everything that we're doing in this curriculum. You know, per, the roles and purposes of clinicians. You know, of course, they range, and, and especially in in that area, the collaboration that we have with Naru's Clinic and Peer Voices that develop this program and curriculum is taking into account both camps and also the training. You know, Naru's does a lot of the training and uh, of clinicians, so we're we're seeing what clinicians' deficiencies are in regards to how to manage and deal, and even maybe self-disclose, maybe a simple thing is how they can self-disclose when it's appropriate. And those are just some of the little things that clinicians may are not being taught at the school level for many reasons, you know, no different than a doctor that may sometimes as a, has, as a licensed physician, but has no experience when it comes to nutrition. So that's kind of like an example that I would probably put on there. Uh, and I'm going through these quick because I definitely want to make it more engaging. So I just want to get through them really super quick. Um, intersection between peer support and clinical practice. So again, turning that chaos into harmony, the validating diversity in training, education, and experience on both camps, highlighting and uplifting each specialty. And I think we're talking of peers as a specialty, and it's becoming more prevalent in our in our community, especially those that serve as peers. A widening gap, bridging the gap, necessity, dangers, opportunities, and methods, all basically at this point with the gap that we see is the one that's losing out is, of course, the clinician is not having all the tools that they need. The peers are, do not have all the tools that they need and the, and the collaboration to be able to navigate that, that consumer and at the end, the consumer is the one that ends up losing out because you have two people that love and want to support an individual through a recovery, but they seem not to have a common ground. And that's what we're looking for. And that's what the curriculum is hoping to achieve. Uh, training and education. Therapists and psychologists may also require complete continuing education courses and ongoing basis in order to maintain their licenses. And that's something always that has been going in the in, in the field of the the uh, licensed clinician, um, but in the in in regards to the peer, it's just beginning right now. So it it is beginning to now after the two years, they're going to go back for more additional uh, you know education in a, a specialized. It could also be just as involved. It could be for other drug addiction, but the peer is also coming into that specialized field. 
Um, the value of lived experience, although clinicians understand this, the peers know how to use it very well. That's our, our main ammunition. But at the same time, we don't want it to be the only ammunition and the only value that, the, that a peer has. The peer has more incredible value. And by adding the clinical aspect of being able to work, understand where the clinician's coming from there, what they're restricted to by their license and be able to meet, meet that training in the middle, it will allow them to really provide the services and actually elevate the peer probably just as much as the clinicians being elevated. So that value of experience, although it is an incredible experience for peers and we use it very much as a shield many times, I believe it has to be used appropriately. And I think in the middle in the clinical and a peer setting, it, it, we can get there with the training. Uh, current trends, you know, trends in the mental behavioral health involving peers and clinician, uh, increased integration of peer support service into mainstream uh, treatment settings. We see this in throughout the industry that they're calling out on peers. Grants are coming in for that. The state is looking at that. And although right now there's, you know, of course, a lot of stuff going up in Sacramento, like always, um, there's definitely uh, a movement in, within the community and a, and a uh, acknowledgement that that lived experience is, is, is definitely valuable as a community health worker, as a peer, and as, as a navigator of someone in that field. I just came out of a meeting with Cal Optima Health, who, as you know, does a lot of the Medi-Cal in Orange County, and those type of opportunities are becoming more and more apparent. The HCS is putting those right there in front of them to be able to advance. Although I see interestingly that they are elevating community health workers because the state, I believe, understands that concept much better than the peer concept of lived experience. And that has not yet gotten to a point where they can understand the value to be able to say, hey, you can be Medi-Cal approved. You can, you can follow and be part of a community-based organization or an ECM, you know, an enhanced care management team or be, part, or, be light, or be contracted with Kaiser or any of these other organizations. But the trends are changing. Um, emphasis on recovery-oriented care. There's a growing uh, trend towards, you know, recovery-oriented. As we know, you know, all of the uh, holistic aspects and, and really giving people what they need in order to be able to, to really reach their recovery. Um, use interdisciplinary teams, uh, trend to, to, the, to this uh, with clinicians with different specialties working together as a team to provide comprehensive care to patients. And again, I've worked with uh, organizations where, you know, they have that, what they call kind of like the whole wraparound for a family, which they will completely work with everyone in the family for for those type of, could be mental health or behavioral health, or just in general, any anything in this in in um, that may need assistance. So that's being, uh, and that includes the peer, and that would include the peer, and getting the peers to be able to work under these conditions is um, is really part of all the training that we're doing to really help them uh, reach that um, application delivery of services. Of course, we all know that a lot of these are being done in a lot of different ways. Like we said, the 12-step support groups, therapy group, case management, all of these applications uh, are, being, are being used, but the peer and the clinicians are, are, are actually approaching these from two different perspectives. So we've been doing a lot of trainings and a lot of support trainings for clinicians, and we're actually putting peers and clinicians like case uh, like a community health workers together in a group to do these support groups and they're quite interesting of course some of them are also intensive outpatient programs the I, you know the iops uh, that also uh, the clinician lead but there is room for the peer to also be part of so all of these platforms and and areas are are really in in my personal opinion um uh, being tested, and we are at the point where all of these peer-run organizations are coming together, and we're putting the data together, and we're working to advance the peer cause. But in our perspective, we really, really want to deliver um, 
you know, the the program in a way where it is going to not only combine the peer elevating and empowerment, but it's also going to empower the clinician. And I know that sounds uh, kind of odd because the clinician is the one that's licensed. They already feel empowered and and somewhat, you know, a little bit um, above where the peer that they are able to provide more than the peer can. Um, but as we have developed and done these, we've been doing this for like over over a year in, in creating curriculum and trainings and had thousands of hours of actual collaboration between organizations, peers, clinicians, and, and put uh, this together, um, we really noticed that the clinicians equally are benefiting from this because at the beginning, I thought maybe the peers would benefit more, but we're seeing an equal amount of benefit on both camps. And again, this is kind of a little schedule of what we do. Um, we we do this on February. We are actually going to be taking that month to, and you're welcome to come visit and watch us and participate. We we have an LMS system, you know, a learning module system, where all of the all of the hours of training and all of the hours of education are being um, comprised, and uh, we're reviewing all of these twelve weeks. And for the month of February, if you'd like to come in and see some of those while we launch in March, the LMS system, uh, February, we're taking that time to be able to get input, perspective from the community, those professionals that are clinicians and peers, and be able to watch some of these modules to see if they have benefit. At the end of the day, like anything else, the, there has to be a value. You have to see that value in order to want to participate. And we do see that there is a value. We've been getting a lot of feedback, a lot of surveys, a lot of the reviews we're getting already. We see a lot of that. But again, um, there's still room always for improvement, as we know, in this industry. But this is our curriculum, our first week introduction, which we go, you know, and a lot of these we take. It's not just sitting around and listening to someone. There is a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of interaction and it has and and we find that that has been one of the best model so we break up the three hours as one to four people come in when they want we're doing this year round so that if you come in for a couple modules in the year you want to come back next year for another module in a few months or whatever that we're still going to be doing this and improving on it so you know we know everyone's super busy uh week two addressing the problem challenges discovering solutions and as you can read, number three, deeper understanding factors. So we go through each of these weekly modules and we went go and we're able to really, by the end of the 12th week, uh, be able to have uh, some of the tests that we provide and some of the, some of the, um, the um, I guess, challenging uh, questions and scenarios that we, we put so that people can really be able to practice some of this as, in, during the 12 weeks or if it's just one week that they're going to be there, they can still come back at the end and take that specific test or that specific area to see how well they do. Um, the power of this is the fact that we have so many organizations that are both peers and clinicians participating. So just, just by virtue of this coalition and the way that we're presenting it, there's already incredible value. Anyway, that's all I have as far as wanting to give too much. I want. I really would like to kind of um, really uh, kind of open it up and maybe get questions or maybe lived ex the lived experience that whether whether they're peers or clinicians and maybe some of the challenges they're going through and you know pros and cons. You know, uh, I mean that's I'm here for that. That's that's what we do best. So that's that. If we can do that, I, I'd love to open it up to anybody who, uh, who, and I'll turn this off. So anybody who wants to, uh, you know, jump in, so they don't have to hear me talk all the time. Anybody? Anybody? I'm just. I. This is a, a an embarrassing question, but can you explain as you were talking yes. about? who your we is is it the Novus clinic or peer voice of orange right. county right so peer voice and peer voices of orange county and Nauru's clinic are actually the founders of peers and and, and the, the peers and clinician coalition you know so that's th those are the two formulating organizations that uh, develop this concept uh so 
being both one, being a, on, a exclusively, like I myself exclusively represent peers. I'm a peer advocate. And then, of course, Dr. G with Nehru's clinic represents the clinical aspect. So it's two camps coming together uh, for this one cause and this one training. So, yeah, that's the way it is. So we, we mention all of it, although we don't have to, but we want to make sure they realize it's not just a formulation of, you know, of anyone just building or creating a concept, you know, which would not be bad if anybody did it and created the peers and clinicians uh, on their own, no matter where they came from. But ours were specifically, I think, brought together or came about because of the fact that both of us had very separate perspectives of the roles, but we both were united in the fact that we realized that we both had deficiencies. There were deficiencies on both camps. And the challenges that we face, for example, when we uh, presented, like, you know, on my own lived experience with clinicians, when we were working with a client or a member or whatever it was, we were always looked down upon because we just only brought in the lived experience part of it. And then the clinician, of course, we didn't realize, yes, maybe they were not putting the peer down, but a lot of it also had to do with the fact that it's their license on the line when they're making and doing things. So now at the same time, does the clinician have sometimes bad bedside manners when it comes to dealing with peers? Our experience, or at least personally, and some of the ones we get, that they, they tend to if they don't understand what the peer role is. And I think a lot of the clinicians or a lot of the organizations that are starting to work with peers really do not necessarily know the rule. So I think, again, like anything else, you know, judging a book by its cover or not understanding that knowledge really puts us at a disadvantage. It puts peers at a disadvantage as equally as it does clinicians. I don't know if that makes a little sense. Carrie, how are you? I'm good. <clears throat> How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. And it's good to see you. And thank you so much for sharing that information. Um, so here in Lake County, um, we have five peer support centers, um, four of which the, are under behavioral health services. And recently, our mobile crisis um, team launched, and okay. they are actually housed next door to one of our peer support centers. And it just really feels like they don't know who we are, what we do. Um, and I've reached out to their supervisor because one of their staff actually came over to our building and was like, well, what do you guys do? Who do you work for? And I was like, okay, no, we can't do this. You know, we've had peer support centers for like 10 years. Um, and, you know, I, one thing that I, the buzzword around is, you know, integrating services, integrating clinic and, and peer support. And as much as I try to educate, cause I feel like this is my journey, you know, like this is what I yeah. need to do. I need to bring them together. And, Love it. um, Love it. Yeah, I, I hear, you know, like management is open to that. They want that. They want to get rid of the divide. But how right. do you like get rid? How do you remove the divide if the other side doesn't want it removed? And and you know what? I really appreciate what you're saying because it's um you're saying it beautifully. I think you're describing the frustration of as also the what why we created this and why I'm an advocate. I'm a peer advocate. Me I too. love pe I love peers. I mean, I'm going to be honest, and I I really also am honest enough to know our flaws. So yes. I I think that and it's, so if you are a peer, just like you're in any, if you understand your flaws and you understand your shortcomings, it actually is empowering because then you don't misrepresent, right? So right. taking that into account in what you're saying, I think what, you're not doing anything wrong. I think that you need to have more more a little bit a few more of you doing the same thing that's why we're creating this and again you can have free membership to what we have 
And then we can all advocate together for that because at the end of the day, that's 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 where it goes. We're in LA, so I got to check you out because we do have a Peer Voices of LA, and um, there, you know, we're yeah, doing we're some... just you know about a twelve-hour drive from LA. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, what city are you uh, mainly focusing on? Um, what area? It's, it's Lake County, um, and I mean we have a population of like sixty-five thousand, I think now. Nice. For the nice. whole county so right. we're you know we're we're a rural almost I, I think that's what it is i think the rural is where it's going to get last to be known although the need is probably greatest i mean so it's right. almost a contradiction right uh, so i think the need is greater even in those areas but i think i think really kind of really bringing uh as many of us on board with you to do presentations to be able to have situations in places like this that can discuss openly and i think right. having an open discussion and really being critical of ourselves not it's not all it's not all good now on the state level just want to give you some input as far as what we see they have a they don't understand the difference between a community health worker and a peer and right. that's been a challenge on the state level to be Here able too. to un right Right. So you see that. And then I think the 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 government and those that are officials up there that we work with tend to want to do more with community health workers because it sounds better appear just a lived experience. So a community health worker just sounds so much better. I got to be I got to be honest, a better title. So it just feels more official so that a lot of these grants that are coming down, I think you're going to have to wear a hat that says, you know, I'm a peer. I just, I just filed. I just ended up filling out a grant recently, and I said, "Hey, we're the same. You want me to fill out a grant for a community health worker? I've been doing it for so long. What, you know, okay, I'll call myself a community health worker. That's what I'm doing. So you have to almost have a little sense of humor and kind of just go with it because there's right. a lot of this, 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 you know, this humor that's out there regarding this. But I, I, I really feel that the, you know, unification of the organizations that, you know. I, you know, I work with Cal Voices. I see Michael here, right? How's it going there, Michael? Uh, you know, you know, all of these organizations that are wonderful, you have to have more presentations to your city boards, to your community, to all of those. And really almost, I would say strategically, my hint would be start talking about peers and community health workers together because I think they understand that a little better. And I'm just saying that now, this is the first time I've said it publicly, but I feel that they would understand that terminology and maybe get us the credibility that we not only deserve, but is necessary so that also clinicians value us. And, and, and that's why these trainings are so important, which we can share with you and you can be part of and get those or those clinicians to start saying, hey, we need them. We can't mm -hmm. do our job. I always look at a clinician and say, you know, when you see somebody for 20 minutes, how can you live with yourself? Why are you not connecting them with a peer? How can you live with yourself? Come on. So I you right. have to challenge. So I know you're a peer. I know you're an advocate. Continue to challenge. <laughs> I, I I challenge all the time. It's just so frustrating sometimes because it is. No, no, all the time is frustrating. You know, I, I think, you know, I've been told that I'm a practical activist. And I think that practical activist means that I am just really stubborn. That's what I think they want to tell me, but they don't say it that way. <laughs> I, I, love that, I, I we have to be stubborn in the process. But here's the thing we're not clinicians are not our enemies. The system is not our enemies. It's no. just a lack of knowledge, a lack of education, and these conversations that we're having. And I really super appreciate it. I mean, you'll have you have my email. Definitely contact us. We can share educational material. We can present wherever you'd like. You know, oh, that sometimes would be awesome. everything that you're that you're saying, everything that we're saying, you could say it. But sometimes oh, yeah. people say, well, bring somebody else to say what I know you could say. I know it's ridiculous. That happens to all of us, right? So yeah. you could say everything I'm saying. You could take these slides and do the same thing I'm saying. But guess what? They may want to see my face for whatever reason. I don't know why. But anyway, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Michael, I'll get a hold going? of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. How's it I'm going? Doing well. Yeah, I'm doing well. Thanks, Orlando. And uh, hey, congratulations for putting this together. 
Wow. Yeah, no, it's been exciting. It's been really exciting. And we've been getting a lot of good feedback on this. And, and again, you know, I'm active, you know, I'm active like what you're, you are, you know, you're one of those as well out there in Sacramento, all the way down to San Diego, you know? No, I just, I, I just want to, I, I just want to say uh, that I, I do appreciate all the work that you have done to even put this together uh, because, you know, being in advocacy development for as long as I have, I know, how challenging this kind of work is, uh, you, you know, to get to get the to buy in, to get the understanding uh, for this level of collaboration between uh, between cl clinicians and the peers is monumental. So, congratulations, Orlando. No, thank you so much. You know, we need people like yourself. Of course, this is really for all of us, um, and we do want as many organizations to create that training and continue the training, you know, whether they use what we're having or create their own. I, I think um, we would want everyone to, within their own organization, have a mini training, uh, especially if they're working in the community to understand, even if you're just a whole 100% organization that only is peer run, you can't send them out there without understanding clinicians. So even in that level, I would say it's very crucial for peers uh, organizations which are popping up and there's a lot of us out there to really understand the clinicians so that we don't demonize anything and we can really serve the community better but i really appreciate anything you could do or anything that you know we can provide i'd love it actually i'll have to lean on you a little bit because i was actually in the process of uh doing what you just completed and i go oh okay i don't have to reinvent the wheel now i can just okay. email orlando no, you know what i I actually feel the same way. I don't invent anything. And I, I can I can tell you about a book I read that actually made me feel very, very dumb and said, look, nothing is, you're not going to say anything that has not been already created. It really is humbling. But at the same time, there's a lot of truth. Look, we feed off each other. We learn from the past. We reformulate, you know, and, and really make that hamburger into something gourmet. You know, that's really what it is, that ground beef. It's just we remold it and create it. But I think we all have that. But yeah, no, definitely. Whatever we can do to support, uh, we're here. We're definitely here, and it's it's growing. So thank you so much. Uh, there's a, a Megan has a question, uh, follow up question. What language have you found most effective when communicating with Dr. G when talking about the role of peers? You know, I, I would love to have have him here because we are polar opposites, and we still are very much in line with what um, the mission is. You know, it's funny. One time when we were doing a training, I turned over and I'm, you know, I'm a peer. So I make a fool of myself. It's kind of like something that you have to be able to laugh at yourself and be able to be yourself. So I turned over to him in a training that we were recording. And I said, you know, you know, because we were asking some questions regarding how we do things. I'm like, you know, and he said he wanted some criticism. And I said, well, I have to be honest, you, you just... Sometimes when I hear you, it sounds really boring. You talk with a really low voice. You don't have any enthusiasm and you're really clinical. And I don't know if peers really um, are attracted to that, you know? So he said, well, I have to give you my answer. I, if I'm with a peer, I don't have to be another peer. I can be a clinician. So I guess that was a, in a weird way, a compliment where both sides can compliment each other. We both don't have to be peers and we both don't have to be clinicians. It's really kind of, uh, it was a unique and interesting, and I hope I didn't butcher his answer, but I think it was similar to that where, you know, he's like, well, you're already here to be the, you know, the, 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 the outspoken. I'm here to be who I am. So he can be who he is. I can be wh who I am. The way I speak to Dr. G is straight and exactly speak and clinical. I say exactly what I'm feeling. And I'm not apologetic, but I'm also very willing to hear what his perspective is. But I think the genuineness of being a peer is valuable and maintaining who you are. I cannot, I am not a clinician. I, I don't see myself ever being a clinician. This is who I am. And I'm proud of being, um, you know, who I am. Uh, Scott, you have your hand up? Yeah, so I, I just wanted to touch base on, on a bunch of things. I'm... A, a, a peer, I'm in recovery 10 and a half years for a severe gambling addiction. And uh, since the beginning of my recovery, 
I got involved as a peer and also participated in clinical treatment. Okay. And I almost immediately realized the importance of the collaborative effort between those two types of treatment programs to benefit the person in recovery or struggling with a mental health illness. And mm. ever since that point, I have been advocating for equality in recognition of peer services to clinical. We're not clinicians. Oh. Clinicians are not peers. They shouldn't try to be each other. Mm -hmm. and they, they serve a valuable purpose yes. uh, in the recovery of us, in the treatment of us, and to help us sustain recovery and, and become healthier emotionally, um, mentally, and physically. And your work in having these uh, integrated training programs so that each can understand their mm -hmm. role is extremely important. And I appreciate that. Um, but well, I just want to say to you real quick, um, I'm going to send you a check in the mail because I you said everything exactly what I wanted you to say. I'm just kidding. Uh, you you know what? I couldn't I couldn't have paid you more if I wanted to to say everything. I really would love to invite you to one of our one of our, our recorded sessions so you can actually be yourself. I, I couldn't have said it better. I wish we would have had you honestly when we were doing some of the recording because I put your face out there. You have said it so perfectly, and I really appreciate it. And I, I wish I wish I had known you before, honestly. Well, um, from this point forward, you do you do know me, and I can give you my uh, contact information for future co collaboration. Um, Beautiful. But it's 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 extremely important that that we understand each other's role, and we respect mm -hmm. each other's role, and we understand yes. the benefit of it. But on top of that, and you touched ace on it before, at the governmental levels, the stakeholders and whatnot, the the funding mm -hmm. is so unequal yes. that it it does it does not allow us as peers to develop stronger programs and and higher recognition. So yes. I and I think that you the communicating to the stakeholders, the the getting to the politicians and showing them what we do. Um, yeah. And listen, I'm proof. I'm proof that the collaborative effort between the two made me the strongest person I've ever been. Wow. No, okay. I I love and, it. I love what you're saying. And you know, I was going to say that it is crucial to really advocate uh, on on a personal level. I think that this process of also peers and clinician really allows the clinician to also learn how to advocate and the peer to uh, advocate with the clinician. So that advocacy level. The consumer at the same time is also empowered to to be able to be, be an advocate for himself. You know, we all accept mediocre services. A lot of the clinical aspects and some of this have horrible data of what they're doing to help people. And the, the, what we are, we're involved in a human rights movement, the peer, the peer rights movement, the peer movement, the community health worker to me are really human rights movements of saying Scott has value. His lived experience has value. We need to value the human, the person. And I think it goes to how the funding goes. Look, I was talking to the president over at, at, at NAMI over here, and he told me a story where he, he actually was with a physician helping and supporting a family member. And he, and, and, what he ended up saying basically is that a the physician, the physician and the clinician that actually connected with the client did not do anything. They didn't give them a they didn't tell them to do anything other than put their hand on their knee, apparently, or be able to say, hey, you know, I got you. You know, we we support you. That human quality does not have a CPT code. There's no billing for being a human. And I think we have to get as close as we can to valuing the support that you can give another human being. Because at the end of the day, that support is probably worth more than anything in the world. Amen to that. So thank you. Anybody, um, I, I know I have a few people here. Any, anybody else want to chime in on, on anything? I know I have a few people here. I usually like to 
put people on the spot and, and, and jump around. I know I see. Let's see. How, how, how about Derek? Derek, you got some some stuff. I, I like to pull people out of the room if you don't mind. How are you doing, Derek? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you for being uh, here. I really appreciate it. I appreciate everything you said. Um, you know, I, I guess I wanted to touch on I, I come from the integrated healthcare model, medical, okay. medical, behavioral and, and the peer. And um, one of the things that I always struggled with, is, especially dealing with the medical um, professionals, is, you know, a lot of times they would often make comments about, well, the peers are too emotional or the peers, they have these issues that they. Oh, Derek, hang on. We are. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. But but I, I, I and I, sometimes I get I used to get offended by that. And I just kind of wanted to know, like, how do you how, what is the best way to to, to engage that and to yeah. explain that to medical professionals that, mm -hmm. yeah, we are we are emotional and yeah. And, and, and we're we're passionate, and, right. and most of us are in this to save our lives. Well, yeah, that's a good question. And the way I, I I deal with this when I employ peers, and I really uh, we have a model in our in our our agency when it comes to workforce. Seventy five percent of the time you're working, twenty five percent of the time you're developing yourself. And I know that's not a model that America goes for, but that's the model we use. You take 25% of the time to develop who you are, where you're at, what you're doing. You cannot provide good service unless you're well. So I think to answer your question, being well allows you to be who you are. And if you, what you are is a little loud, a little bit emotional or a little bit whatever, it works as long as you have that balance to be able to know. So that knowledge of yourself to know hey, I felt like this before and I don't want to really go back there. I'm going to tone it down. There is nothing, you're never going to be exact. We are a moving target when it comes to emotions and our feelings, our knowledge and where we go. So we can't put an exact. Now, I deal with a lot of black and white individuals in my life. I enjoy them because I need them because I am not black and white. I'm totally like gray and the way my brain works and the way I am who I've built. I see the whole picture, but I really enjoy and respect those that are black and white and can just, you know, go one to a hundred. Now, the empowerment of that individual is what's really going to allow you not so many, so much the rules. It's not about how you someone's going to treat you, if someone's going to offend you. It's really the empowerment of the individual to address the issue in an honest way. Hey, hey, uh, Derek, you know what? I didn't really appreciate that you said this. And I just want to know where you're coming from. Not, hey, Derek, you insulted me. I don't, I think you're a bigot or I think you're a racist. That's not going to go anywhere in my personal opinion. So I think us, what we're trying to do is empower the peer as well as the clinician. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've learned a lot about clinicians. They're very scared. They're very scared because they really do know that they have someone's hand, you know, they're, they're the life of someone in their hands and they're doubting themselves and they can't get close enough. So they're making an observation from the mountaintop. Peers are right there in the trenches mm -hmm. and both, both are not the best way to do it. So again, going back to your question, the peer will have to learn how to regulate their emotions so that it becomes valuable but not the only factor in how they function. I love my emotions. I don't want to lose my emotions. I like to be excited. And sometimes because of my own diagnosis, I kind of get a little bit excited, a little more excited. But I prefer that than to be, this is Orlando. How are you doing? Everything's good. And try to keep everything under control. So that's kind of like, a, I don't know if it's a good answer, but at least it's somewhat of my thinking. It, but if it's, I can add to that, Orlando, we we as peers have the same fear, that same fear that clinicians have about um, having the peers' life in our hands. And sometimes, you know, we get off a, a set out of a session, and we doubt ourselves: should have, could have, would have. And yeah. you know, what happens if? Um, you know, is it our fault? So we have the same fears that clinicians. Absolutely. Have. 
we're just providing a different type of service. Right. No, absolutely. And the way that I address those, and those are great, and that's a great point. It's an incredibly great point. Thank you for that. I I address those issues when, and you know, when I have uh, training and I have, you know, we do a lot of debriefing with our peers to be able to manage their emotions. So to answer Derek's question as well, you have to like exercise kind of like if you're doing weightlifting, you can't have a lot of emotions if you don't have the strength to lift them up and to right. be able to manage them. So yeah. that's where the debriefing and the explanation and the knowledge comes. So, you know, uh, Scott, here's the way that I would say when a, when a peer is doing and feels that way, I would say go back to those things and review it in a, in a, in a format where it's productive but also, what are you missing? Kind of like I made a little bit of fun to say to the clinician, you know, how dare you see someone for 20 minutes and not give them resources or, and connect them with something else? So that's where you come in as a peer, having being solid. If you come in and you're taking care of yourself in that 75, 25% format and you're healthy, you feel good, I bet you that just Derek alone without any resources is going to be the best person to really meet that person where they're at. Now, if you can add additional resources, connect them to clinicians, navigate them and be there, that may be the best that we have right now. Now, do I feel that it's where we should end up? No, but I also have to be realistic about the system and not overburden myself because I still want to be able to support those that I can. And it and I mean and we're all going to make mistakes along the way, and we have to forgive ourselves. That's part of the journey. But going back and being honest with ourselves is very, very important. I just want to say one last thing, and because you know it's been my experience that when you have a collaborative, team-based approach, you get better outcomes. And I don't know who how other people don't see that. Or well, realize. I'll tell you. I think everybody sees it, but I think here's the problem: Have you met a human? We have a very difficult time collaborating. We have to first be able to remove what our bias is, be able to look at ourselves and know that when I look at a person, how do I see them? What's my first reaction? Do I know how to put my emotions into check and say, I know, oh, wow, he's a black man. I already have some bias, some implicit biases that I may not want to deal with. You have to deal with who you are in its entirety Otherwise, you're always fluffing everything up and you never really get to the bottom. Once you can be honest at that level and understand yourself, then maybe, you know, then you might not like certain parts of yourself. Then you have the opportunity to change. But if you always fluff yourself up and don't really realize those areas, you know, that you don't like, how are you ever going to change, you know? So that's kind of like what I, how I function. And again, I'm giving you insight into my psyche. I don't know if that will help or not, but <laughs> that's how I do it. Um, uh, anybody else have some other uh, feedback? I'd love to hear Annette or, or Jules. Hi. No, I'm just Hi. listening. I want to see. Uh, I'm just here to listen to see what how. Well, I work here with clinicians that are social workers, but they have the okay. title as clinicians and also uh, making linkages to their PCPs and other services in the community. But when you, when I read the title, I said, oh, I want to see what they have to say about this. Because, okay. Well, I, I'd like to ask you a question. You don't have to say too much. I, I know you want to just kind of listen, but I just want yeah. to ask you, Annette, well, you mainly focus on the clinician. What do you think about peers or what do you know about them? How about that? Well, Real I am. I, no, no, no. I, I, I said that wrong. I, I am here to support the clinicians. Okay. Support they okay. send me the referral. I work with the parent. I make linkages to the PCPs okay. and make sure that the child gets um, their appointment met and met. And uh, yeah, I support the parent. Got it. Okay. Any themselves. challenges? Any challenges that you have right now? Yeah, I don't have be... no work. <laughs> the what? I don't have no work. It's pretty <laughs> slow in Santa Clara County right now, believe it or not. <laughs> Wow, that's interesting. What what county? I'm sorry again. Santa Clara County. Okay, Santa that's interesting. Clara. That's it. Yes. Is that a good thing? Maybe that maybe you need um, a break. Well, yeah, it's a good thing since I came from a nonprofit, very intense uh, rehab facility for women with children. Now mm. I'm here at Kidscope, and I'm a mental health peer support worker. 
uh, here for the three clinics, the birth to five and the youth group. So I, um, I'm just pretty much making linkages. It's, it's kind of a break from all the, um, the hectic work that I came from. So I'm That's not, a good really, thing. yeah, I'm not complaining about it. I'm just, um, but I don't want to forget what I've, you know, what I have inside of me, the knowledge that I, I just, no, know. absolutely. No, yeah. absolutely. Do not, whether you're a peer or clinician, I, I think, you know, I, I think, um, uh, Derek said it, you know, and I, I think also, um, uh, was it that, that said it, uh, basically that you have to be yourself, you know, and, and I think Scott ma mentioned as well, uh, you have to be who you are and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I mean, we're not here to re, remake a peer into a clinician or a, a clinician to a peer. So, yeah, you know, exactly. So I, I, that, that's important. I think the one time that I spoke up and out as from a peer, well, actually from a peer point, from um, what a parent might feel, or just um, just speaking up because I, I was in a staff meeting and, and one of the clinicians was kind of just venting, I guess, but it was constant about, you know, how um, the level of work of the client and um, just, you know, I just didn't like the way it was coming out because I, yeah. in my mind, I was like, well, if that's why you feel, then maybe you need a vacation. Because, yeah, uh, no kidding. <laughs> Because, you know, from a parent's point of view, and, and if, if that's how you feel, uh, you know, it's like, I was kind of letting my feelings get in the way, because I, I if that's really how you feel about your client, then what are you doing working right now with this type of clients? So, um, yeah, I, 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 my, my heart was broken. I had a, a mentor who I love very much, mm -hmm. and I was at the Be Well Center down in Orange County, and my heart broke one day when he came in. Mm -hmm. And he actually he was part of, I'm not going to say too much because you'll know who he is. But anyway, um, bottom line is he came into a meeting and he he was just somewhat disgusted with the system of of, of the people that he's serving that it's yeah. kind of like a um, they just come in and take advantage of the services. And, you know, it's kind of like one of those, you know, in revolving yeah. doors is a term that he used revolving door. Oh my and God. and. I was a little hurt because I just admired him so much and I kind of felt that he was burning out. And I think, I think with him peers and clinicians and the work that we do, there really should not be a need to burn out if you're being genuine. And yeah. then that me, and that has to be that transparency of the work that we do. Because like I said to him, I said, you know, well, you know, I don't have the answer unless you have the answer. This is the work we do. And we, we have to do it lovingly and, and really have that compassion to be able to understand that we're not all going to do things in the same way at the same time, in the same manner. And if we don't understand that as a peer or as a clinician, uh, we are going to be really frustrated with our own concepts of those that may not be eating correctly, doing yeah. drugs, um, you know, and, and, and really the reason how they got there or are homeless. And now it becomes a, a really your job. You, you entitle your job to being the judgment of the person instead of really trying to find how you can assist and be supportive and take that 25% again to take care of yourself. Because if you're only doing your job, then maybe you're forgetting about yourself and really having those conversations with yourself. Like, why am I doing this? Am I doing the best job? How can I develop myself and take care of myself? Because if we take care of ourselves when we're doing this work, we should be able to do it. Yeah. But I don't think, I don't think, you know, with a caseload of 20 or 30, sometimes the, I, see, I hear that in the clinical side, it's really quite, quite difficult for a person to take care of themselves. So we have this, these disparities within our own system that we're not taking care of those that are taking care of others. And that's a whole other subject, but that's really important to me. Yeah. I, instead of um, holding any resentment, I just talked to my supervisor and I told her, you know, it, it kind of, it made me feel uncomfortable to hear him talk like that about his clients. And um, how do you advocate that? And, 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 I, and I don't want to well, challenge you, but how do you do it? How do you even advocate that? I know how yeah. I would do it, but I may be fired. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what I did. I, I advocated to my supervisor and I told her, you know, manager, and I said, it, it really made me feel uncomfortable. And, and um, you know, do they forget for that I'm, I'm advocating for the parents, that I am a parent? 
that, you know, that's who I support. I support the clients and I'm here to advocate for them. I go, as a parent, I wouldn't like my clinician feeling that way about my child, you know, so um, maybe you can let him know and remind him that I am a peer support worker and I am here to advocate for the parents. So what he would say towards a parent is what I would feel as a parent. So um, she goes, oh, no, I yeah. love it. I really congratulate you. I, I, I was really impacted with a documentary when I was young um, and it was about the Black Panther Party and actually some of the problems they were having down in Oakland with the with the uh, police and everything else. And, you know, an eloquent uh, Black Panther, I forgot his name. He basically uh, was in a meeting and, and he had the police there because they had kind of united them over all the problems that were going on. And he, he really made such an impact in my life as, as a youth that I, I can't believe it's still with me. I can feel it and get goosebumps over it. But he, he he basically addressed the police and said, look, if your partner is doing something wrong and you're standing by, you know, mm -hmm. who are you? You're complicit, you know? And I think all of us in society, and again, I'm not here to judge anyone, but I do judge myself in that level. And I put myself and say, hey, if you're going to stand by while something is going on, and you don't, and just because you may not have the education, knowledge, or the degree, or whatever it is that's stopping you, I'm ashamed, I don't I want to be liked, all of those things that are more ego-based, if I don't say something, I feel responsible. Yes. And that's kind of a consciousness that I we want to try to instill in peers, because there's a lot of us, and peers can make a difference in the behavioral health system. But I don't want to just say peers only. I think peers with clinicians are both necessary. So that's why all of this is so important to us. Yes. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Thank you for being brave. I, I really like that. Um, Jules, did you want to say something? I know I had I had called on, and if you want to say anything, I, I definitely. Um, if not, that's fine. Oh, I got Jules over here. Here we go, Jules. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I want to be wherever you're at. Well, no, thank you. I mean, you've really got me thinking. And uh, I think what I think about is a lot of my lived experience, even just growing up in with in my community. I, I'm from Santa Cruz, California, and uh, I'm Chicano by background, Native American. And I grew up in. Oh, my cat just tried to jump on me. I have, uh, oh, I have to tell you, I have a Chicana here at home, just so you know. Ah, OK. So, you know, uh, yes, we have lots of energy and we sometimes can be very fiery. But um, you know. <laughs> But I grew up uh, in, a, in a household of uh, social, you know, civil rights activists. My parents were both poets. Um, like you, I grew up around civil rights networks. And mm -hmm. I really experienced right away this kind of separation from maybe like the adult system. And um, I started helping my friends just informally. Like, hey, let's work on resumes. Let's do things together. Like, I don't want to see you get caught up and in trouble you know, flash forward, I graduated from college, everybody's saying you should do something with your degree. I was, you know, into sociology and I started working in group homes and they pretty quickly saw that I was a, kind of a troublemaker. I was calling things out. I was saying, hey, we shouldn't be restraining kids this way. This doesn't work. A and troublemaker, isn't that interesting? Are you, are you categorizing yourself as that? Because I think those were called intelligent people that are not understood. That, that's another term yeah. for troublemakers, right? A lot of times I was pulling out perhaps like ethical or philosophical things or doing research <laughs> and they would pull me in. So they pulled me into community work until these wraparound teams and they gave me a role. I was a family specialist and I didn't really realize I was a peer support specialist until, you know, maybe five years ago. And, wow. and so really just thinking about the lived experience and this feeling of bringing advocacy into what we do in community but also having a lot of friends who are clinicians and have kind of gone through that similar work and gone through the clinical training. And so just sitting in this space, you really have me reflecting on so many different categories of my life and personal, professional. So just want to say thank you. Thank you, Orlando. Well, no, I, thank you for, for sharing. And also, I, I'm really curious, I mean, what do you do now? What kind of stuff do you, I mean, I, I can see you're yeah. an act, activi activist in a sense. We all are. Just any person we meet on the street, we are an activist. We are influencing whether you realize or not, everything influences, right? Absolutely. No, I mean, there's. I guess I carry many hats in the world, but what I do right now, but professionally, is I uh, I work for the Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing, which is an entire mouthful. Um, wow. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but what I do is I work around the All Cove project, and that's an. What project is it? What's the name of it? It's called All Cove. And I'll throw a link in the chat. For throw folks. a link in there because that'd be interesting. We do a lot with teens as well. We 
and and we we love that you know so that's wonderful yeah i love that yeah and so i mean here so what i do is i work around this project that's looking to bring an integrated care model to youth uh uh 13 to 26 here in california um and peer support youth peer support is one of the main service streams wow yeah well there's an organization that we partner we have two uh, partnering uh, organizations one is communities voices out of uh, out of um san diego the other one is teen for teens help dot org which is a, a friend of mine jeff long he does amazing work he does a lot of production but it's more of a uh, um, you know, a virtual type of system for teens with a lot of lived experience videos and everything like that. Uh, they may be working with you because I he mentioned an organization that he's working with to get some validity. I don't know if you know Jeff Long, but he he we want to be able to reach that community. Uh, yeah. I work a lot of internships with the youth, and I I when I meet with them, they laugh because I'm like, well, you know, I'm here, but what do you guys want to do? Because we've already at my age, we've already messed everything up. What, what ideas do you have? Do you know what I'm saying? I want to. I would like to hand off the um, the torch over to you guys, and I think I want to empower them to be able because there's some incredibly, incredibly bright and I would say amazing youth that give me goosebumps and that have such value that are they're really. If we look at that, we're going to feel the hope that we all are looking for. So I'm I'm touched by that. So, you know, I appreciate what you do. And definitely we got to collaborate and figure out how we can do something. That'd be amazing. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. How are we, how are we doing? Anybody else have any uh, any thoughts? How are we doing with time, Chloe? I wasn't sure. I don't really keep clock. You know, I'm a peer, so I, I can go two or three hours um that's not a problem you know yeah, yeah the time is go ahead michael yeah the time is 4 37 right now and i believe we have to 4 45 that's true oh very good so thank you so much for keeping me on track yeah that's one of the characteristics of peers right so in, in going to that a peer and a clinician right a clinician puts his timer and hits the timer and says okay 20 minutes here it is and then those 20 minutes they're expected to produce something that is maybe that should be natural and it should come in a more natural perspective we don't have that space and i'm realistic i know we're capitalists i know we have to have these all of these things in order to produce a society of rules and things so uh you know but putting that aside there has to be some margins to be able to cover those extra things and that's why i really believe like the peers and clinician and the the working together as as many mentioned um, are is really crucial because that will really you know Derek mentioned creating that that collaboration together um, is is really crucial in order to really have a full wraparound service. Otherwise, you really are are lying. I guess to yourself, I hate to say it in that in that those terms that you are providing services. I I, I think that in our I want to be challenged, kind of like Yelp, and just us look at our Yelp ourselves and say, how many, how many stars do we have in the work we do? And how many would we have? You know, I don't want to put it out to society because I think we put it, we'd probably get a one or a two for what's happening and the, the work that we're doing. Although the work itself is probably a five, but I think our delivery may need some improvement, you know? So that delivery for me is building that alliance and the coalition. The hardest part that I have is, how do we get people to work together? Because even within our coalitions, you know, people have their own trauma, their own biases, and their own perspective of how things should be. We are not taught how to collaborate, but still maintain our individuality. So to me, that's what I'm looking for. How do I work with Michael and bring him into a coalition, value his individuality and what his value brings but still he can blend in when we need to work together, you know? So those are the things and the skills that I think are needed in nonprofits, in the behavioral health system, to be able to get to the next level. Again, I may be a dreamer, but I'm gonna to continue to dream and, and really push this, this forward and, and get any support. I do wanna put my information there, uh, my phone number for sure. You can always reach out to me. I, I take texts all the time. Believe it or not, I'm one of those insane people that really does that. I'm going to put it in there so you can actually call me anytime. Text me and send me your contact info. And I'll also put 
my email for the peer voices, which is the peer voices one as well, which is my main one. But also, let's see here, if I can spell. Very good. Yeah, well, Orlando is typing, and uh, and and we won't put him the pressure of having him type and chew gum and uh, talk at the same time. Um, but I, you know, as he was speaking, you will see me laugh or snicker quite a bit, and 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 that is because Orlando is such a unique person. He he will actually uh, reply your email and your text and and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what's funny. Um... What's funny is that um, I really am pretty real. Like when I when I end up like today, I'll give you a perfect example. This presentation, I jumped on at 329. And thank God Chloe picked up the phone and was able to send me the link. I am a peer. I have a lot of stuff going on. Dr. G kind of referred this one over to me and I had his, her assistant and I'm, you know, putting it off saying, hey, I got to make sure I do this, make sure I do this and make sure I do this. And at Today, at 3 o'clock, I was registering, or at 2 o'clock, who knows when. And at 3, I was on the phone trying to get a hold of Chloe, but I had a different number. I didn't get on to this meeting till 3.29. Now, why am I revealing? Because that's that's what happened. Why shouldn't I? Can you handle it? Are you going to see me differently? I don't worry about that anymore. You know, I used to worry about it. I think revealing who you are, because... I'm certain that we all are hiding something in a sense, some shame, some bias, things that we don't want to talk about. So I honestly, you know, uh, I remember being in Japan and a lot of, and I was near a, a really exclusive area in Mount Fuji and all these women came out naked. They were in their eighties and nineties. After they got dressed, they, I actually asked them, I thought Japan was a very conservative, you know, place. I mean, I got Japanese women running around naked. Guess what? They told me, they said, you know what? I'm old enough now that I can do whatever I want. So I think all of us have to find what age or when we feel old enough to do what we have to be and be ourselves. I don't know if that makes sense. So I thought that was amazing. And that was also very impactful. And that was a long time ago. Um, Derek, you had something you wanted to mention here? Okay. No, 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 thank you. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I just want to jump jump in real quick to, you know, um, from some of the statements that, that people have shared um, that, you know, we have to realize that we are all evolving. The systems yes. are evolving, right? This collaboration between the clinical side and, and the peers is evolving. And, and let me tell you what I would like to see evolving is that, you know, traditionally we have we have this rift between the family members and the and the peers their loved ones that they that they are that they support right there is this deep divided rifts that culminated in legislations that is ineffective that we know of like proposition one coming up and very challenging and, and, and very all, challenging yeah, they're very very challenging right and so you know we have to evolve past the stage where um, the focus needs to be on on the clients and their recovery, right? Not many Absolutely. people really fully understand the recovery model and and how the medical model fits in. Mm -hmm. We are evolving, and that's why you know the the course that you develop um, to train both parties at the same time is so so valuable. Well, and, we need it. We need it, but we also but need we your need participation. It. We need the peers and the clinician to participate and criticize it. We need criticism. We need to say this doesn't work. We need to develop it. We need to change it. The curriculum as it stands, I'm going to be honest, would probably look, not look the same in a year from now when we get, you know, thousands of people to participate. So I think that you, we have to be, you know what my biggest fear is, Michael? Uh, for me personally, I am afraid to wake up the next day and think I know what I'm talking about. I don't want to be confident because the minute I become confident, I end up thinking I know something or I know better. And I never want to be that person without, you know, of course, walking around, not knowing how to put my pants on, you know, but other than that, I want to be able to make some decisions, but not feel so confident. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but I, I, I sometimes we in society are putting too much emphasis on confidence, but I don't want it. 
I really don't. I don't want to feel as if I know how to tell you how to do something. That's so arrogant, you know? Yeah. And um, I, I currently am on the steering committee of uh, California Association for Peer for Pref peer professionals yes if if uh, there are people here that are not familiar with that look us up the website is californiapeers.org and basically what we are trying to do is continue this evolution of peer support right i uh, you know we are working on well what what is what is beyond after we get our certification what then we are trying to right. evolve us to a stage of you know creating a career path and this is by the way a brand new career path it is uh with management levels with uh that if we steer this correctly i want to develop it more into different areas of specialization in peer support right absolutely and aside from management tracks i want us to start thinking about consultancy tracks and yeah, that's a good area. Right. But you know what? A lot of peers are going to become clinicians too. Remember that. That's another area that a lot of people don't want to address, specialized fields that they will be very close to a, a clinical perspective or even clinicians. They may get their PhDs. Why not? So I think that there's going to be a lot of blending and I think that's going to help a lot as well. But yeah. you know, I was going to say, Michael, we are we have a lot in our plate throughout California and we are bringing these large or entities together we already have our eyes on you. Don't don't think we don't know. And we have some people there that are bringing us together. So we definitely are going to collaborate. This is very important, and we have to be able to do it together. That's the that's the hardest part because we we have to teach people peers to be able to be self confident so they can collaborate. A confident person can collaborate. An insecure person cannot collaborate because he's still worried about himself. You know what I'm saying? So that's my perspective for me. I don't know. Don't want to judge anything on that, but that's my perspective. I'm just going to piggyback really quickly um, and invite everybody to the five o'clock session. There's just one session, which is the state of peer support in California. There's been a lot of conversation around, around California. So I'm going to put that link in the chat and then. Perfect. Thank you. And wonderful. And thank you so much, uh, Chloe. Uh, thank you for getting me in there at 329. Uh, it was wonderful. We made it. Uh, as you can see, peers cut it close, huh? Hey, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, my information's in there, and I'm sure you can find uh, on the invite and everything. I'd love to continue conversation. You can reach out to me anytime. Um, definitely, Scott, I, you know, and Derek, uh, all of you, Jules, I definitely would love to make contact. Carrie, you know, everyone else, and anyone else here who may. Uh, I, you know, may want to say something, Annette, I know participate, Megan, everyone here, uh, please reach out. Uh, I'd love to continue the conversation. I will Thank definitely you. reach out and, you know, we may cut it close, but we get her done. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. That makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> you can check your email, Orlando. I already sent my information to you. I love it, Scott. Thank, Thank you, you so and much. I, I need to pick your brain on the, the subject that you address. So well, let's talk, definitely. Hope you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Derek. Thank you Bye. so much, guys. Bye-bye. Have you. a great night. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you all, and thank you, Orlando. Yes. Let me let me get that link and I see if I can get in there. I think it's just you and me right now. But uh, okay. oh, the, which link did you mean? Oh, no, I was just going to see because I was going to see if maybe I can jump in that link and see if anybody's oh, yeah, on yeah. there. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy it. Yeah, I'm gonna copy it right here. I got it. So five o'clock should be a good one. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, well, again, that's you know, uh, you understand, peers. This is the way we do it, right? Yeah, I'm curious actually, I, and I didn't know if you'd have interaction or not, so I kept my questions. But oh, absolutely. You first um, develop your collaboration with, like, I mean, whether it's Dr. G or someone else. Like, I mm -hmm. feel like there were people out there who haven't quite figured out how to make that relationship happen? Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I've been studying this whole market and I'm definitely came from not only the business world, but the peer world. And I think we have a whole other arm in our, in our organization, which is Peer Voices United. And we are taking 
programs and we're making them into programs and we're fiscally sponsoring them and then being fiscal agents and then turning them into a 501 and then making them part of the whole uh, peers united type of coalition. Um, they can they, it'd be their organization, their president. They do it. They can run it the way they want to. But the only thing we ask for what we do to get them, you know, grants and money, and we're doing it already with five organizations is we only ask that they continue the peer advocacy and work together and create that 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 unity. So we already come from a lot of collaboration. I learned really way back as I was young of my deficiencies and I knew that I needed help. And I think maybe more so than some because I saw what I couldn't do. And I said, well, if I can't do it, what is you know, why can't Chloe do it? You know, why can't I ask her to help me? And I think leveraging out on our strengths and, and, and abilities and partnering is crucial. So I always do that. So I'm out there in the community doing a lot of advocacy. And I definitely, Nauru sought us out, to be honest. They sought us out. I didn't even have to search for them. They sought us out and, and we were supporting them. So we supported them already. And then they saw, wow. These guys are amazing as peers, and I think that's where it comes. So, but I think it's an easier transition now than when we started. And I and I think any any organization is going to need the clinical side, especially with medical the license, you know, licensed individuals that you're going to need to work with. So, the HCS, as you know, has done and, and tried to put a lot of this peers on the map. AHP gave a lot of grants, all of those good stuff, but they missed the boat. They didn't have a plan of how to get peers to do Medi-Cal. You know it's different than what it is. We all know this. We've already kind of broke the, the code, and we already know, at least in Orange County, we're breaking the code. San Diego and L.A., we're breaking that code to be able to know how to do it and collaborate with plans. But we want to have a stream of all organizations. We want to share what we have with other organizations. We want all of all the organizations, you know, 10 organizations aren't going to cut it in California providing services. You need a thousand. You need five, you know, you need a thousand, right? I mean, as, and, and well connected. So I think that that will transition into the power necessary for Sacramento. So we're involved in a big movement. Right now we're about 25 strong. That's pretty good. So many of those are only peer, peer voices in some capacity and others come with their name, but they end up adding the peer voice united emblem on their website and then they collaborate with us on the web we have a lot of that we're all about collaboration and i'm sure we're going to be hitting you guys in la to work with you you know um we just made a change in la we had a change in 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 leadership in la and and we we just ended up uh, you know temporarily filling that position so you know we work with we we work with like painted brain and others around we know them, which you work with as well, I'm sure. Um, you know, so we will have something that we're going to work together on on this and and bring to LA. You know, great. So thank you so much, and I'll let you uh, transition to the other session. You no, know, I appreciate it, and thank you so much for everything. We will be in contact. I'm sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.